thank you all for either attending today or listening to this later when you have a little bit of free time. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Today's session, we're going to do a little bit like a fireside chat, just without the fireside. Uh, it actually, it is getting a little bit colder where Kathy and I are here in Cleveland, but I don't think it's fireplace weather yet, Kathy. Um, but nonetheless, uh, let's go ahead and get started. I'll start by introducing myself. I'm James Morris. I'm Senior Vice President of Product at Brand Muscle. I'm going to play a moderator role today. This is my first time doing a moderator role, so um, please be patient with me. Uh, and then I want to introduce you all to my esteemed guests. Uh, first, we have Kathy McPhillips. She's the Chief Growth Officer at Marketing AI Institute. And we also have Helen Baptist, the Chief Strategy and Market Officer from Brand Muscle. So thank you both for joining me today. Absolutely. <laughs> Overall approach we wanted to take with this is, I think we're all getting questions around AI, what that means from a marketing landscape. We're hearing from, you know, Helen and I talk to local marketers and teams that oversee local marketing all the time. We hear, Kathy, I know you're hearing from agencies and corporations all the time about what, what the heck do we do with this? So the goal is really to kind of deep dive into what each of us are doing in our own worlds, what we're seeing be successful, um, even things to be cautious of, risks there. Um, and where we aren't really pushing yet because either AI is not quite there and ready for it yet, or even organizations aren't ready for it yet. So that's really the goal of today, so that anyone listening walks away from this feeling a little bit more confident about where they can be successful with AI, and to make sure that no one feels like, hey, this is going to take my job. That's not the goal of this. We're not trying to say this is going away, but potentially your job changes and what that looks like. So to start... Um, we have to discuss Maycon. So the Marketing AI Conference, which is hosted by Marketing AI Institute, was a few months ago now, back at the end of July. It's, I think it's crazy to think that it was just a few months ago yeah. now. Um, but really, Kathy, can you tell us a little bit about the conference itself, really how it started from conception, where it's come to today, and what's changed in the marketplace since you guys started this? Sure. So Paul Reitzer, our CEO, he started the Institute back in 2016 after, at that point, seven or eight years of being interested in artificial intelligence. And he just, he was reading stuff about space and technology, which he has just a real passion for. And it's, the more he heard about AI, the more he was like, wait a minute, I own an agency and there's so many applications. I feel like this could help me streamline, scale my organization. And then it turned into like this passion project as a blog post, a weekly blog post series on the blog, which turned into the company. So in 2019, he wanted to host an event here in Cleveland. And at the time, it was 29, July of 2019, I came in as, a, as an attendee. I was working for a different company locally, came to support Paul. He was a friend of mine. And I left there like, oh my gosh, like, I don't know how I will use it right this second, but I really know this is going to be a thing. And I left with a lot of inspiration, a lot of passion and a lot of, I don't know what to do next. And I think what's happened since 2019 and this year's event is I left there saying, I know what I'm going to do next. There was there were tangible case studies, there were tools out there, there are people that are doing it and talking about it. And I think that was the biggest difference for me because quite frankly, if you look at our team, I'm our target audience. I'm a 30 year marketer, which sounds crazy to say out loud. Um, I have, and I'm shifting what I'm doing because of these tools. So I'm like, show me all the things, like this is just so much fun. So I think it's just really impactful on how the my day to day has changed because I'm able to be more efficient and be smarter and focus on the things I love doing. I love being creative. I love being strategic. I don't love the reporting per se, but I love the analysis of the reporting that AI can help me do. So it's just making me help me be more efficient in my day and doing the things that I love. And I know you all have a great podcast. I mean, you guys use all this technology almost every day, right? You're playing around with it. You've become more operationally efficient. We have, you know, I use five or six tools every week for the podcast and I've taken what I think, which I and I have guessed, not guessed, I've looked and said for all the things that I'm doing, I'm that could, should have been 20 hours of work and I'm doing it in under three. So, and it's things that I am doing faster and it's things, it's doing things I wasn't able to do before because of bandwidth, because of skill, because of so many other things that now I'm able to do all, I'm producing our podcast. I don't know how to produce a podcast, you know, but these tools are helping me do it. And if a, if there was a professional podcaster who looked at what I was doing, they would be like, you probably could be doing it better. And that's absolutely true. But for what we need right now, I'm able to do those things. But there are also bigger things like Paul, our CEO, wants a speaker reel. 
I can't do that. I can project manage a speaker reel, but do we need to, the professionals are still needed in many capacities. And quite frankly, then they can do the things they love and not do these all these little things that we couldn't do before. Kathy, can I can you just talk a little bit about what so I was there as an attendee, right? And I feel like it was drinking from the fire hose and the rate of change is so fast. What's really like changed since that time frame in July? I think the biggest thing I've seen is that people are just getting smarter about the technology. And instead of just going in and saying, I'm going to try this tool, this tool, this tool, they're being more strategic on why they're testing a tool. They're finding a problem or a use case to use a tool versus just saying, I'm going to try ChatGPT or I'm going to try anything else. It's like, I've got a problem and I'm, I'm going to figure out how I can solve it using these tools. And I think with that comes a lot of, am I allowed to be doing these things? Can I be putting my data into a tool or my copy into a tool? And where does where where is that data going? Where where is my IP? Where is it going? So people talking about should I buy a tool or should I build a tool? That's been a lot of conversations I've been hearing. And that's a little bit out of my league. Like I get I can talk about it, but I'm not the person from our organization who would be the person who would decide that. But I want to be in those conversations because I want to know you know, what the outcome is going to be. What are the outputs I can get from this? What's better about it than me using a tool that I've purchased? And a lot of the tools you're, a lot of the things where you're building your own tool is from the same people that are doing the other things. It's just, you're now doing, they're branching off into different parts of their business. And then to finish, and then also a lot of people are trying to figure out, you know, with Microsoft coming out with everything they're doing and Google, do we need all the smaller tools? And my answer to that, I think, is yes. But I think it just, it's, it's, as, I, as anything, it just depends. Yeah. Helen, you mentioned it was that you attended this past year. I think it was your first year attending Maycon. What were, I guess, a lot of questions. What were your immediate thoughts of the event? You know, how have the last few months evolved for you, the team, uh, at Brand Muscle, et cetera, based off just your learnings and conversations? Yeah, so I think uh, I think it's interesting because in a prior company, uh, we were at the first event in 2019, I think, Kathy, uh, if you recall, um, with the co-founder speaking at, at your organization's event. And then this year, I got to go. And for me, it was really refreshing to be in a room where people weren't guarded about protecting their secrets or their secret sauce, that there was a common goal towards understanding um, what is actually happening and how we might help each other. Um, and I think the mix of both B2C and B2B and multi-vertical um, really was different from most of the other events that I go to, like the analyst relations. And so maybe you become the Switzerland of analysts for AI. Um, I think the other part for us is, you know, we talked, there was a lot of talk about responsible AI um, and making sure that people don't go rogue and do things that are malicious or malintent. And, uh, you know, I, I was on stage and asked the AI Institute for um, the Marketing AI Institute for a, for a responsibility clause, and we actually rolled it out to our staff and it's included in our handbook. And everybody has signed and agreed to the fact, and a lot of the language is yours. So that's the first thing that we did when we came back uh, was make sure that the organization understands that it's okay to play, uh, but you have to be responsible with what you're doing. But it, I think it, to your point, it goes even further now is like, what are we putting in to those open source uh, large language models uh, without risking our IP and making it available for others. Uh, that is something that we have conversations about all the time. But you know, for me as a marketer, I'm looking at every function. There's a lot of talk about BDRs not being efficient and effective in, in the new sales cycle uh, world. And so we're looking at ways to you know, automate a lot of that through either conversational email or conversational chat. Um, we're using it for automating our RFP processes where we're standardizing that. That's a point solution that we're using. Again, it's our model in their model. 
Uh, we're using it for uh, contract lifecycle management. We're using AI in that. Um, we are revamping our website and migrating a whole bunch of old content to new content. So how do you optimize that for um, new brand voice and value propositions and uh, across the board? I think the other one that's really key for me is um, in our own company, for our own clients, uh, we're seeing more and more the Adobe stepping up as well for for not just verbal content, but graphic content. Um, and so our teams internally, our graphic designers, uh, more than 100 of 140 of them, uh, are being tasked with how do you use that responsibly first, but then how do we make sure that our IP is protected for the highly regulated industries that we're in um, and the compliance pieces of that. So if you think, I, I think I talked about this at Macon, is if you think about liquor sales, each county, each state, each brand has their own rules and regulations. Um, and that is really the database that we've got around those things, along with the US Patent Office and the Distilled Spirits Council, et cetera. So the, those are the kinds of things that we're seeing. Um, you know, how, how does the job change? Do you have to be a good prompt engineer? Uh, you have to be a good QA person to really understand the nuances. Uh, but I think to your point, it's what problem do I have and how do I solve for that problem or the use case and make it repeatable and scalable as well. I think if you take out the words AI from what you're saying, you've been doing this for a long time. You're, everything you're doing, you're seeing if there's technology to assist you. You yeah. put that word AI, you put AI on it and everyone's like, oh, no, no, no. You're like, you're already doing it. You're just trying to find more efficient technologies for what you're doing. And I'd be remiss. Um, going off script here for you, James, you're trying, you're trying to moderate this, but you two both spoke at the event. So Brand Muscle is like doing really cool things. And I came into your office one day and I was just like, you guys are ahead. You know, just the things you're thinking about and the ways you're approaching things is just very, very cool. And for people watching this saying, oh my gosh, I'm so far behind. If you're watching this, you're not behind. If you're interested in the topic, it really is, you know, get on board. You, you will be behind soon, but you're not right this second. Yeah, I think Jeffrey Moore's book, right, Crossing the Chasm, the chasm's right here for y'all. Um, and anybody can get on at any time. Um, and I think um, Paul, Paul from your organization says it the best, like it's as, as nascent as it's ever going to be right now. So like, you're not behind, just get on board and try things, so. So let me ask you guys this. <clears throat> you're hitting on youth cases a lot. And I think what we saw with, OpenAI, when they introduced their enterprise version, it was to really make companies feel more comfortable with sharing their data, right? This is locked in, you don't have to worry about this. That seems to have been at least the facade of concern for recent months is that, well, what are they doing with my data? So we've seen a lot of point solutions come up and appear that are solving use cases. Um, Kathy, for you and what you guys are seeing at the Institute, how are those use cases evolving? Are you starting to see more complex ones that are? You hit on this a little bit. You think the, you know, are we going to go to the the Googles of the world, et cetera, and Microsofts that are kind of making this all in one place? Are still the use cases very much one-off point solutions? Or are they more holistic? Where's that going? I think what I've seen, and again, I'm just one person, what I've seen the most is really people trying to figure out, I just need a starting point. I just need... A, a, a win so I can go to our leadership and say this is right the, you know this is this is something we actually are going to save money time and everything on and again it's not about losing headcount it's about being more efficient being okay. you know, gaining that competitive edge whatever the case may be so I do think it's more focusing on that one thing um, so I recently gave a presentation probably a few months ago to a group of CMOs and this group is amazing. There's strategy. Every single week, it's talking about strategy, go-to-market strategies, team building. I mean, all these big picture CMO topics. I went on and talked for 20 minutes about me using a just tool to edit a video. And people were like, slow down. Yeah. You know, so people, the really smart people are still trying to figure this out. So I think if you can bring it back to just some really finite, tangible examples, I think that's where we still are in a lot of instances. In many instances, there are things going concurrently. It's like, let's find those wins, but let's think about a bigger picture and how we're going to scale it. But right now we need to focus on the little things to get us to the big thing. I think one of the biggest ahas that I had, I think, uh, again, through some CMO conversations, is that you have to make the 
prompt be the best person of the task that you're trying to achieve. So you are the BDR leader and you're writing a new sequence for, right? Or you are the SEO expert and you need to make sure that the H1, H2 and body copy is optimized for, for SEO. So making sure that the machine understands the role that they're playing uh, is, is, is a good starting place. For me, that's one of the key learnings that I've learned in the last couple of weeks. Um, you know, there are a lot of people who are much bigger experts than, than I would ever be in this. I think part of it is making an investment on your own time to do some of this stuff, um, to not be afraid. It's pretty scary. It's the wild, wild west. Um, but, you know, um, I've spent a couple of hours every week just playing around on a specific problem that I'm trying to solve at work um, and giving people the prompts that I've written and keeping a prompt library, right? Uh, so that they are uh, there for record keeping and can be optimized as your prompts get better. Um, and I think that's kind of the two tips that I have is like, who are you when you're writing this prompt? And what prompt did you write? And can you find it next time that you want to write it, whether it's in a Google Doc with a table of content as the, the head for the prompt, right? Um, but I think investing time in this, you know, in the 40-20 rule of, of work, which is 40 hours of work and 20 of self-development, uh, that's kind of where I spend some of my time is on self-development on AI at the moment. Yeah. So we, I've, I have a Google Doc of just my prompts that I've been keeping for myself. And I know it's all in any of the tools that I'm using. And I do test out a few tools every time I'm going to do something just to see where I'm getting the best results. And it's never the same. So there are value in all of these different tools. But Paul said we should, when if we get an enterprise version, we should, you know, we'll have our prompting library. We can share each other's prompts. And I was like, you don't want to see my prompts because they're so silly. And I'm still trying to figure it out. But there, you know, once I get to a point, like, okay, but one thing Chris Penn mentioned, I don't know if it was at Macon or just I talked to him quite a bit, was ask the prompt, ask the tool questions. I am doing this and I'm trying to build whatever. And then it gives it, okay, what questions should I be asking you so you can better give me a better output? And it's yeah. remarkable once you can get in there and figure out how to do that. It takes a minute just to kind of, you know, just twist the line of thinking on how you're doing it, but it is pretty cool. Yeah, we've been doing some blog content at Brand Muscle, and similar to what Chris Pym's saying, is just asking, what else do you need to know from us yep. to help with this content? What's going to make this more impactful? And you're right, the questions feel like a complete interview style, and they're great questions. And you look back at going, gosh, I'm such a doofus. Why didn't I think about giving you that information to begin with? Uh, I, I'd also plug, too, for anyone who's listening, is that there's great tools out there just by Googling. So. I struggle with mid-journey. Anyone Wait, who uses shouldn't you ask Chat GPT, not Google? So, so good point. Good point. <laughs> I'm I'm looking more at YouTube videos. YouTube's uh, an area where I consume a lot of content, embarrassingly enough. But I found I so I am the worst at mid-journey prompts to get images the way that I want them. I'm horrible at this. And I wish I should have it to credit this person, but this individual I found on YouTube had a link to a Google Doc to Kathy's point, where he used it to train uh, ChatGPT on what mid-journey is, and then he asked ChatGPT to create the mid-journey prompts for him to input to get the images he wants. And it's incredible. It uses different cameras or camera styles or the camera settings, um, and it gives me everything I need, but I would never have done this on my own. I could not have told you how to coach ChatGPT on what mid-journey does or anything, and thank goodness this guy has an eight-page document that does it. So that's my plug. The, there's content out there. There are tools that'll help you. Um, if you feel like a neophyte, just look around. There's people that'll help. And if you try something and you get a really bad output, it might be you. It's, it might not be <laughs> like just yeah. don't give up. Or something you tried a few months ago, if it wasn't giving you a mid-journey, if you look at you know mid-journey a year ago versus mid-journey now, it's bananas. Like it is so yeah. good. So all these tools are getting better every single day. I'm just going to change subject for one quick second because I feel like uh, there's a lot of talk about this in Hollywood, obviously, with the SAG and writer strikes and all those other things. And, and I've just signed a contract to do live video uh, production. Um, and the editing license was one where they wanted 
to be the only ones that could do the editing for the next year, right? Like that was part of the agreement. And I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going down to like three months because I know that if I put this in, I can get new editing out of it. Um, what kind of impact do you see beyond marketing, right? And I feel like some of those shows are marketing, but because there's always product placement in them. So how does that and that intermix together, Kathy? It's so for <laughs> curveball I mean, question. You know, but I did, I did just listen to Kara Swisher was just on Smartless, um, my favorite podcast. And it was just that the way she was talking about AI um, and how she was explaining it to three people who don't understand AI who are in the, the in Hollywood, it was it was pretty cool to listen to how she was explaining it. I'm like taking notes. You know, I'm like, I'm gonna, that's a great way to, to explain it. But they were like, just, is this my stuff? Who owns it? Are we getting royalties? Are um, how long is this content going to be out there? It was all these questions that were coming about that I just hadn't thought of because I'm not in that side of things. But your point about even about having life, being able to edit this thing for three months, do you want it even out there in three months? Because some of these things that we're talking about right now, we might look back on this podcast in a, a year and be like, I can't believe we were talking about yeah. this. <laughs> you well, know? The, ones that, the ones that we're producing, yes, because it's your core bread and butter. Uh, but how how the, we actually do those jobs a year from now may be changed, right? So how we do print production, how we do swag and fulfillment and all those other things, but um, right. core marketing, branding materials, uh, I think, you know, the Gutenberg, uh, the, the Heidelberg print press has been around for however long it's been around for. I think it'll be around for a while still. <laughs> I do think, I think Kathy, you hit on a really interesting point, which is traditionally when we've had teams, technical teams within the organization look at other software and tools, they look at it once every year, every two years, et cetera. That's how often they revisit. So we look at something, we identify, you know, not yet, it's not there yet. And we think, let's put this, let's table this for a couple of years. We'll come back and readdress this. I think what we're seeing, and I'm sure you guys are seeing the same, is that within AI tools, you can't wait that long. It's sometimes just a couple of months. Um, Helen's working on a, a new website, an e-commerce website for um, one of our sides of our business. And we have two dimensional product images that we want to be 3D images, but we don't wanna go take all the photos of everything. So we're looking at AI tools. And a month ago when Helen asked us this, uh, there wasn't anything great. Right. There, there wasn't a good way to do this, at least from a cost effective perspective. And then, uh, Last week, a member of my team sent along, he had found a new tool that had just come up and he thinks it, it's promising. In the next couple of weeks, he's predicting we might be able to use it and execute it out. But it's the evolution is absolutely insane here. Um, everyone compares it to Moore's Law and it's just not even a comparison at this point. It's absolutely insane. How do you guys, how is the Institute recommending teams manage this? I mean, what's the approach? How do you how do you roll up in your sleeves and actually understand all the solutions out there and make sure you're staying on top of it? God, I can't, hate to keep going back to this use case, but really it's fig finding something that you need help with and going to the, you know, it's not even, maybe, maybe it's not even going to a tool that you're not already using. If you're using, you know, it's going to a tech and saying, going, calling your customer success manager and saying, do, can you do this? Do, if, yeah. And if yes, why are we not using it already? Why have you not told me about this? How can I get this? I want my whole team to know about it. Or is this in your pipeline? Is this on your roadmap? Do you have something coming down that I should just wait on? And can you give me a timeline because I need, I have things I need to do. Or do you integrate with someone who can help us just so your tech stack is, you know, staying kind of in um, together or do I have to go out somewhere else? So it's just, there's no right path to take right now. It's just, um, starting with, I think, who you are. It's a pain to change technologies. Um, so starting with what you already have, seeing if they can help you, I think is a very, very important first step. Because we don't know what we don't know. And and we, and even the best customer success managers, it just, it's work, they don't, I mean, they're trying to keep up too. So having those early conversations now with, with those folks is really important, I think. I think you bring up a really great point, Kathy, which is every MarTech vendor is probably looking at AI in some way or already has it. And I think it's incumbent upon those companies in their QBRs, which are usually crap, sorry. Um, I, I was on that side of the house, so I knew what was good and what wasn't. Um, and I think 
the you know those companies need to be more forthright with what they are incubating and or working on and not hold for big user conferences it has to be iterative to where they are at a point in time uh, to the conversation that they're having in a QBR this month, next month, the month after. Um, you know, Salesforce had their Dreamforce last week and there's a big release there and I have no idea what it is, yet it has, and I'm, I own the contract for, for Salesforce here uh, as the CRM holder, right? And so how do you, uh, and, and I'm, like I'm a little, you know, minnow in the big ocean of, of Salesforce world, but, how do you make sure that your customers know that you, what you have and or are working on and how can they help you iterate it quickly based on the needs that they have uh, if you're a MarTech vendor out there? That's what we're doing on our side where James is actually piloting a lot of stuff with customers um, across the board. Again, highly regulated industries where there are some things in our templates where uh, they're really locked down, right? So if you're a, a local affiliate for a, a fintech serve, a, a finserve company, uh, they lock the, the templates down and they don't want them iterating on content because they don't trust them. Uh, but could you open it up with AI and they're asking us to open it up and make sure that it's got grammar and spelling and those kinds of things in it. Um, and so they're iterating with us to make our products better. And so I would say, those companies that have AI or are emerging into it need to start to do that with their customers as well. So one of my tricks I do a lot when I'm looking at tech and is I go to the mark the person who's in my role at that company. Elizabeth at Market Muse is a good example. I the product people are great, the creators, are, you know, all those people know what they're doing, but I want to know the person that's actually using their own tool for the job that I'm doing. So yeah. I do that in a lot of different companies and that's just, you know, just being savvy and not stopping with the customer success because oftentimes they could be wonderful people, but they are not fully informed. So just being sure that you're talking to the right people or you're asking the right questions. And if they don't know, just say, if you don't know, can you just get back to me, go yeah. to your product and get the answer and then come back. So being patient with them and just making sure that just doing your due diligence with those folks. Yeah, I mean, we have an we have an incubation team, and James may not have been involved in the incubation at some stage. There may have been some other product manager that was pulled away from him, um, and that actually happened, right, James? I, I think the you know incubation happens in small groups, like Tiger Team, almost, right, in some cases. And to your point, it's about asking the right questions to the right people at the companies that you're working with, as well. So the last question I had kind of pre-planned in this one is, uh, Helen, from a chief strategy officer, chief market officer perspective, how are you looking at AI and leveraging it for our clients, not just internal, but as well as external, um, both short-term and long-term? Because I think those are a little bit hard to balance right now, long-term, especially not knowing where the-, where long -term the Long-term is like going. two weeks. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, Look, I think uh, the agents, so we partner with a lot of agencies, right? So the agencies own the creative brand on our marketing services clients, which are Fortune 1000, you know, whatever, uh, clients in, in multiple uh, verticals. Uh, the agencies are coming to us and asking for help to optimize campaigns, to optimize templates, to uh, be more efficient and effective. Uh, but I think the the end of the day, brand muscle is all about compliance and quality output, right? In terms of protecting the brand and protecting um, our clients from legal ramifications and lawsuits. Um, and I think that that's the balancing act between the agency and the MarTech companies like us, uh, where we're doing some services on behalf of agencies, we're doing some services on behalf of our clients. But at the end of the day, understanding the IP for that client and their requirements is really the differentiator. Um, and so this trade-off of time versus cost is compromised, will compromise quality. And so we have to make sure that quality is really uh, taken into consideration on anything and everything that we're doing so we don't get into lawsuits. I was talking to my my dad tonight at dinner. You know, I want to make sure nobody's doing a trademark infringement and or plagiarizing 
Um, and those are the kinds of things that I worry about from our side uh, to protect us and our clients at the end of the day. Yeah, so I think um, just touching on that, you know, you, we talk a lot about our AI zag and our place humans, and you know, there's so much of the when I was when you were showing me what you were doing, there was so much of the human input before about getting all these terms and conditions in, all these different things by state, by product, by all these things. And now you can automate a lot of that and you can use AI to help you with all of that, but you need the person on the other side of that to check it. So like a human is still very, very much needed. It's just in different, you're just reskilling people on how to use these technologies. Yeah, and I, I think a good place to look at, Kathy, and you know, uh, is automotive, right? Everybody thought that the AI robots were gonna get rid of a lot of people. Uh, I think there's some people on the picket lines uh, you know, but at the at, at the end of the day, there are still humans involved in uh, producing cars. And so if you put that basic framework in front of yourself, you will always see humans involved in marketing. You will always see humans involved in sales. Uh, people buy from people. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's what job does that person do? Doing redundancies and outreach you know, um, email cadences and those kinds of things or tel telephone calls, can that be handled through a less expensive means of automation? Probably. Um, getting to setting up that disco call as opposed to, you know, having somebody back and forth for four weeks, you can have it done in days as opposed to weeks. Those are the kinds of things that I think we'll see change. Um, but I'm excited about it. You know, it, it's scary as hell, believe me. Uh, but I think investing the time and learning and not, I think you said it, Kathy, is not to be afraid to try. You're going to fail once or twice, but you're only going to get better every time you do it. So. so one of the things, I gave a presentation a few weeks ago, and I was talking about how when I started my career, one of my biggest things I was trying to do was I was trying to get on national broadcast TV for one of our clients. And I did this whole analysis took me probably 80 hours. I'm not even joking about, okay, we're in 200 DMAs. We want this national buy. Every market needs to make sure that they're getting you know, equitable ratings or spot, we're filling in versus the national campaign, yada, yada. So I spent all this time doing this and I think like, and then I saw, I didn't see this commercial until it was done, until we went on the air. And I was like, that's what's running when I spent all this time doing this. And you can't cancel it. You can't change a commercial that you spent 30 grand producing. All these things, and now it's like you can start something and if it's not working stop so we have this luxury of being able to move so quickly and be so agile with with these tools with the creative with everything that we're doing so it is a great benefit to us right now well and i think the other thing i would say to you is that it's easier to do a b testing it is they are right so you can write your subject lines you can write your your headlines your seos you can test them in in, in ai and uh before you even go live into production so just, just something else to think about. Well, I love thank, talking to you, Kathy, by the way. <laughs> you know, <same. laughs> I learned something new from you both every time that I talk to either either of you individually or together. So it's always a pleasure. Um, Helen, I know you're on the other side of the world right now. It's uh, late in Australia. So I appreciate you um, jumping on and doing this with us. And Kathy, thank you so much. We love having you. Hopefully we can do this more often, especially as we talk about this will probably be in about two weeks. This will probably be dead in the water and irrelevant. So uh, <laughs> wait, can I just ask for a last last minute plug? Please. Maycon 2024 is when? September 10th through the 12th, 2024 in beautiful Cleveland, Tickets Ohio. Tickets are available now. Tickets are available now. At, May, at Maycon.com. <laughs> I'm such a bad marketer. At Maycon, M-A-I-C-O-N dot A-I. That AI, yeah. okay. And sponsorships are not available yet, but count us in. Yes, they are available. <laughs> you just You've never talk. been to Cleveland in September. It's beautiful. Best time of the year. Best time. Best time, of the year. time of the year. Okay, well, thank you both. I appreciate it. And we'll talk to you guys soon. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.